Okay, so today what we need to do, well, let's recap just a little bit. Last time we kind of got introduced to Verilog as a concept. We looked at how to install the tools, how to download everything, um, how to write some basic um, Verilog code in Notepad. Um, we did it in Notepad just to kind of illustrate, again, that, you know, there's nothing special to it. You don't have to install special programs or anything like that besides the stuff that runs on the command line. And we also took a look at how to run everything in the command prompt. So navigate back to ECE 2372. Blow that up just a little bit. Right, and then, you know, do stuff like I Verilog, option O, circuit.bbp, circuit underscore tb dot v. You know, how to run this stuff in Verilog. Are there any questions about the stuff that we talked about last time? Cool. And then, of course, if you had your own sort of like little quirks or things that didn't work for you, um, for sure just come to my office hours and we can take a look at that. So what we want to do today is, first off, get out of this universe, right? There's a sort of a better way to live our lives. Um, and that is by using a, a more advanced editor. Um, there are a number of them out there. There are some really popular ones, like, um, in fact, let me pull up some stuff. Pull up the other monitor, let's see, there's, Atom is an extremely popular one that you can use, um, especially if you're a CS major. Um, a lot of tech startups like to use Atom. Um, there's, of course, Notepad++, which, in my opinion, is a little bit old and out of date, um, but there are plenty of people that still like to use Notepad++. That's a valid option. Uh, let's see what else is there. There's Brackets, I think, used to be a thing. Yeah, Brackets is another sort of editor that you can use. Any of these will work with Verilog, right? The important thing is that Verilog is installed on your computer, not on any of these programs, right? We're just gonna use these to make it a little bit more attractive to look at um, than just looking at the blank black and white on a notepad. Of course, also there's VS Code, which is what I prefer. Um, I used Atom for a long time. Um, I like Visual Studio Code better because a lot of the basic stuff just kind of comes default out of the box, right? Atom makes you start from scratch and you add packages to it to sort of craft your own, your own IDE. And I didn't want to deal with that. Verilo Visual Studio Code does a lot of that stuff out of the box for you. A lot of the basic stuff, like providing a PowerShell and, and stuff like that. I just like it a lot, so I use Visual Studio Code. You by no means need to use Visual Studio Code. You can use any of these options. Any questions about that? Okay, so in keeping with that, um, let's use Visual Studio Code, because that's what I'm going to use. So here's VS Code. Um, mine might look different for your, from yours, because I've done some customizations to my own installation of Visual Studio Code, so I've got a different like color theme and stuff like that. Um, but it should work pretty well for you right out of the box. So the first thing I'm going to do is, you know, you can go File, Open Folder, open up that EC2372. I already had it open, but I just wanted to illustrate that. And you can see all your files sort of listed here in the left-hand side. Um, and we can open our stuff. So there's our circuit.v file. Double-click that. Ooh, by the way, this is what our output of our simulation looks like. It's not very human readable, but um, it works for the simulator. Then, of course, we've got our test bench. And we've got all our code here. Does some basic stuff right out of the box, like provide line numbers and stuff like that. Um, a big thing that Visual Studio Code does is that it provides a terminal. Um, so I think if I come up here and say, hey, what, new terminal? Yeah, it'll pop open an instance of PowerShell right here in the bottom. Another way you can open that is by hitting Control tilde or Control apostrophe will also open up the terminal as well. And from here, notice that it's even handier. It will open directly to the folder. Whatever folder you have open up here, when you open the terminal, it will pop open um, the PowerShell right there. So I can start immediately and start doing, you know, I Verilog option O, circuit.bbp, 
you know, circuit underscore TB dot V. Right, do all the stuff. I can open GTK wave from right here inside Visual Studio Code. So we can visualize our signal. Remember, this is just the waveform that we had last time. So for that reason, I really prefer to use Visual Studio Code because a lot of these cool tools work right out of the box. You can do, you can customize Atom to do all these things, but you got to do the legwork yourself. Um, the only thing we are missing is you'll notice that there isn't any of that sort of handy syntax highlighting that you've kind of gotten used to um, that makes your code a little bit more readable and easy to work with. To do that, we need to install a package. And the package here, I'm just going to go to the sort of extensions menu. I guess Adam calls them packages. In VS Code, they call them extensions. And I'm just going to type in Verilog. Um, let's see. One of the ways that you can sort of uh, vet your packages. So there's a bunch of Verilog packages here, right? Um, so the question is like, well, what do you use? A good rule of thumb is if one has just like a ton of downloads, uh, you should use that one. So for example, this first one that came up first has 8,673 installs, whereas the next one here has uh, almost 150,000 um, installations. So you can see the next one here has 14,000. This one only has 800, 6,000. So if you're not sure what to do or you don't know specifically exactly which extension you're looking for, you just want something that does the job, again, the best rule of thumb is always whichever one has like vastly more installs than the other because that's a sort of a way of, of knowing that the, the community has vetted this tool and, and likes it and a lot of people download it. So we're going to use this one, this Verilog dash HDL slash system Verilog slash blue spec uh, system Verilog. That's a mouthful, but we're just going to hit install and that's all we have to do. It'll take a moment to sort of process that. And then now if we go back to our Verilog files, hey, look at that. All of our stuff is highlighted and is good to go. So now it looks a little bit more like readable code like we'd be used to seeing. So that's all we need to do to get up and running with Visual Studio Code. Again, notice all I did was install a package because I get a lot of emails that say, well, I installed Verilog on Visual Studio Code. No, you didn't. All we did was install a package that made the colors pretty, right? We did the work of installing Visual, installing Verilog on our computers in last class, right? And that's why we're still able to run it from um, the command line. We're still able to access our code in Notepad and stuff like that. So there we go. Any questions about getting uh, Visual Studio Code or getting the packages with uh, the syntax highlighting fired up? Does the uh, package come with the error squigglies? Just the, the error squigglies? Yeah, like, uh, it's pretty cool and we're like, it highlights it, says that you messed up somewhere. You guys are so spoiled, man. Let's see. Um, so I took a semicolon out. No, no error squigglies. Um, I mean, that's a tough thing. I mean, and there might be a package that does, like, um, I mean, you might dig through here and find one that does syntax uh, linting, as they call it. Um, but no, right out of the box, it doesn't do that. That is, in fact, a lot of structures um, or programming environments won't do that. The again, the stuff that you're used to in Visual Studio in your CS classes, working in VS 2019, writing C++ code, that stuff is not the norm. That is, it's like training wheels that they put on for you guys. So yeah, no error squigglies. You still got to do it. You know, so if I remove the semicolon there, and I go to synthesize, you got to live with the errors that the compiler throws out. So, boom, there we go. But that being said, like, one of these might do that. There might be a package that uh, does error checking for you. Okay, let's see. Let's move on to some other good stuff. I had a plan for what I wanted to talk about today. Oh, yeah. Let's, you know, we had a two-level circuit here, right? This one was a, well, sort of a two-level circuit. But let's say that we had, let me pull up my notepad. Let me 
find my stylus. Give me just a second while I plug this guy in. Does anyone have an instructor that made you guys have class virtually instead of giving you the snow day yesterday? I don't have any classes Tuesday or Thursday. Well, that's nice. Kind of takes the joy out of a snow day there, right? Since you didn't have class anyway. Takes the magic out. Oh, where I am, it's probably a snow day as much as everything's frozen over in a solid layer of ice day. It's a solid layer of ice day. Yeah, you're right. That's a better way to put it. Okay. So let's take a look here. Let's design a combinational logic circuit. Um, I'm going to kind of make this up as we go, but let's say it's a circuit of three variables. Let's make them, you know, A, B, and C. And let's just make our output Y. So we'll go through the whole kind of combinational process. What I want to show you guys today, in addition to some Verilog syntax uh, things, some Verilog syntax uh, tips and tricks and, and things you need to know. We're going to walk through the process of, let's start with the truth table, let's do the K-map, let's get our optimized solution, let's draw the logic circuit, and then let's put it in Verilog, and then let's write our test bench. We're going to work through the whole sort of design uh, flow today, and then you're going to get a project. So we got to lay out all of the inputs. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And let's just do this. I'm gonna make this up. Zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one, one. All right, so we've got a truth table. Now, let's say that y we know now is a function of a, b, and c because the next step from a truth table is to get the midterm expansion. And so that's going to be what? One, two, four, six, and seven. One, two, four, six, and seven. I'm going to full screen that for you guys. Okay. Next up, let's go ahead and lay down our K map. So we're doing a th three variable map of Y, of A, of B and C, zero, one, zero, 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 one, 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 zero. And then let's say we have one, two, four, six, and seven. Look at that, it's not gonna be a very clean uh, map. Okay. All right, so what can we group? Let's say we've got, oh, this guy is going to be by himself. So we're going to have y is a function of a, b, and c. And this first one is going to get us, what, a prime and b prime and c. Or Let's see, we're going to have a group of two right there. 
So that's going to give us um, B and C prime. We do a group of two there. That's going to get us A and B. And then finally we can group across the top and that's going to get us A and C prime. So there we go. Now that we've got our minimum sum of products expression. Now we're ready to draw the logic circuit. So let's see, we're going to have one, two, three, four AND gates. Two, three, four. Tied to an OR gate. And then let's see, the first one is going to be a prime, B prime, and C. Second one is going to be B and C prime. Next one is going to be A and B. And the last one is going to be A and C prime. All right. So there we go. This is the combinational logic design process that we've been talking about since like the second week of class. Are there any questions about how we derived? Oh, I just realized you guys couldn't couldn't see the logic circuit that I was drawn. So there we go. Four AND gates: A prime, B prime, C. An AND gate for A, B, and C prime. An AND gate for A and B. And an AND gate for A and C prime, and they're all tied to the OR gate, which has the output to Y. So, any questions about drawing this logic circuit? All right. So now we're ready to go ahead and implement it in Verilog. So we'll go ahead and get us out of OneNote. Let me take it over here. Uh, let's just go ahead and create a new circuit. Um, let's create a, let's create it we name it circuit 2 dot V now we can sort of set everything up we've got so module circuit 2 it's gonna have inputs a B and C it also has Y remember that in the parameters listing we don't make the distinction between inputs and outputs we'll do that here in a second and we have end module. We have an input for A, an input for B, an input for C. Outputs and an output for Y. All right. So actually, let's take a look. Now we're ready to implement the logic circuit. Logic circuit implementation. But there's one thing that we have to talk about first. If we go back and look at the original circuit, right, it was just a single logic gate, right? The output went straight from one gate to the next. But that doesn't happen in this circuit. If we go back and take a look at this guy, we've got the signals that go from an AND gate to an OR gate. We have these wires that connect the AND gates to the OR gates. So what we need to do is have those represented in our Verilog code. So we need to create these wires as their own objects and give them names. So we'll just call these guys wire 0, wire 1, wire 2, and wire 3. And we need to implement those in Verilog. So what we're going to do is 
come back over here and instantiate our wire. So we have a wire for wire zero, not Q zero, wire zero. A wire for wire one, wire, wire two, and wire, wire three, right? So wires are for the intermediate signals that are gonna take our, that aren't inputs or outputs, they're gonna connect internal logic gate outputs to other internal logic gate inputs. Oop, and I'm, just, I'm in the wrong file. Let's go ahead and close that and not cause any problems. Wires. So now we're ready to implement our logic. So we've got our inputs, A, B, and C. We've got our outputs, Y. And we know from having drawn, you always got to draw your logic circuit first, that we have um, our wires. Now actually, let me, well, let's just keep doing it this way. So now we're ready to do everything just by making the assignments. So assign wire zero, and that one was equal to not a so to do a not gate we do the tilde sign so and not b and c and assign wire one is equal to b and not c assign wire two is equal to a and b and assign wire three is equal to A and not C. And then finally, our output, assign Y is equal to wire zero or wire one or wire two or wire three, semicolon. And there it is. There's our whole Verilog module for that logic circuit. We used wires to connect our gates, um, did the assignments for each of the individual terms, each of the product terms, and then it didn't OR gate. Now you're probably thinking, well, couldn't we have done this instead, right? Couldn't I have commented everything out and just said assign y is equal to what do we have not a let's put it in parentheses not a and not b and c or b and not c or a and b or a and not seen just like that. And the truth is absolutely. This is this is valid Verilog. You could have done it just this way. And for a circuit as small and simple as this one, this is probably good enough. Um, this is pretty readable. It's not too tricky. And so you could write it this way. However, I wanted to show you guys how wires work because almost always they're not going to be that simple. I want you guys to get comfy with creating wires as intermediate signals. So, any questions about implementing this circuit in Verilog? Uh, would we not be able to use like the uh, C style knot, so like an explanation point as a knot operator? Wait, say that again? Could we not use like an explanation point? Uh, as a not operator? No, that's in Verilog. It's the tilde, so it's not C. So what he's asking was, you know, could we have done that for all our knots? And the answer is no. That's how you do it in a lot of languages, but not in Verilog. Verilog uses the tildes to be knots. Any other questions? It's a good question, though. All right, now let's go ahead and write our test bench. So I'm gonna create circuit two underscore tb dot v. 
And we need to set up our basic stuff, our time scale, one nanosecond slash one nanosecond, our include for circuit two dot v, and our module circuit two underscore tb in module. We got our inputs. We got our outputs. Remember, we use regs for our inputs, reg A, reg B, reg C, and we use wires to carry our output, so wire Y, then our unit under test, so our module circuit 2, UT, then A, B, C, and Y, and then finally the test. Simulation, initial, begin, and end. And let's put our boilerplate stuff. Remember, we want to create a waveform file, so we'll say dump file, um, circuit 2.vcd, our dump vars, zero, circuit 2 underscore tb, And then down here at the bottom, we'll put our finish statement. Now, let's do some stuff. Okay, we're gonna implement a different style of notation, right? So what we need to do is verify that the entire truth table works, right? So we would start by saying A equals zero, B equals zero, C equals zero, and then delay for like 10 nanoseconds, and then we'd say A equals or we might say just say C equals one and delay for 10 nanoseconds. And then we need to say that what B equals one and C equals zero and delay for 10 nanoseconds, right? We're gonna go all the way down the list. Now it's not hard to see why this is gonna lead to a structure that is sort of confusing um, and you know not very fun to look at. So there's a better way to write this syntax. We're gonna use what's called vector notation. We're gonna say in curly braces, curly braces do have a place in Verilog, and we're gonna put inside A, B, and C. What this does is it says, let's take all of these signals. In this case, these are three one-bit signals, and it says well, we're gonna treat them as one three-bit signal. So I'm gonna say three, a single quote, B for binary, zero, 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 semicolon. And because I'm lazy, I also tend to like to do the delay on the same line with another semicolon. So just to recap that, we're doing vector notation. So we're combining all of these into one single signal, right? A bus would be another way to look at it. And we're saying we're going to assign to that the three bit binary value zero, 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 right? That means a zero in A, a zero in B, a zero in C. And then for the sake of readability, I just put out to the side, then delay for 10 nanoseconds. From there, we can just copy and paste everything, right? So that'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So one, two, three, four, five, whoa, what am I doing? five, six, and seven. So now we're cycling through the truth table and we're testing every single um, outcome. So any questions about how we just dumped all of that stuff in? Or any questions about the vector notation? You guys are awfully quiet today. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and we'll run this and then we'll kind of play around and see if um, there's some easier ways to, to go about doing this. So let's say I Verilog, option O, circuit two dot VVP, circuit two underscore TB dot V. Whoa, look at that. We got some syntax errors. What happened? Okay, so check it out. So we got a lot of stuff. So a debugging tip is always go when you get a huge dump of errors, right? This is gonna be 
true for any um also like that it sort of sassily says no give up at the end for any time you're programming in any, or excuse me debugging in any programming language when you get a huge dump of errors always just go to the very first one and just focus on fixing the first one first because that actually might fix everything else and in fact i think that's going to be the case because at line 18 um, i misspelled initial so we'll hit save and we'll run it again Hey, look at that. So just fixing that one, even though we got a whole dump of errors, just fixing that top error resolved all of those. So that's good to go. Now we got VVP, um, what do we call it? Circuit2.vvp, created our dump file. Now let's go ahead and say GTK wave, um, circuit2.vcd. We go and grab all of our signals. All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and grab one node. I'm gonna bring it in in here because we want to compare our truth table to what we got in the waveform. Okay. So let's see. So it seems like it's working, right? We didn't get any errors. There were no red lines, right? When you screw stuff up, you're going to see like red lines and blue lines and all kinds of weird stuff. Everything is green, which is often means you didn't screw anything up. Your logic might be wrong. Your truth table might be wrong, but um, all is uh, all is well. So what we expect is we're just going to go. We did every 10 nanoseconds we click through. So we can kind of click through each of these and see that it lines up, right? So we're in min term one. Y should be equal to zero. It is equal to zero. It's good. Now we go to the next one. In one, y should be equal to one. It is equal to one. That's good. And we go to the next one. Y should be equal to one again. It is equal to one. All is well. On the next one, three, y should be equal to zero. It is. So that's good. And then we go to the next one. Y should be equal to one. It is. And then the next one, y should be equal to zero. For one, zero, one, one, zero, one gets a zero. Yep, sure does. And then the last two should be one. And we have one and one. So we just kind of clicked through the waveform diagram looking at the signals on the left hand side and we know that our well our guy is, is good to go there. So any questions about that? Is there a space goes out so it doesn't like so cramped together? Say that one more time your your audio is pretty choppy. Is there a way to space uh, those outputs out so they don't like divide on top of each other? Um, not that I'm aware of. I've really never spent a ton of time like digging in the GTK wave and looking at customizations, but no. Basically, you're saying like, can you just, like space them out vertically so they're not quite so so deep? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. Dude, you might you might spend some time messing around um, and trying to customize this. I mean, there's lots of options here, but I've never done that so so I can't tell you off the top of my head okay so Cody asks a great question um, did you run the test bench by clicking run or did you type the commands at the bottom of the test bench file like we did in the command prompt um, the answer to that is um, by typing at the bottom so there is no run oh so I see run up here again man you guys are, this visual studio thing man they got you on those training wheels I'm not even sure what would happen if I hit run or debugging, yeah. So this is this is nothing, right? There's nothing up here for us, right? We ran the we ran the simulation by typing down here in the bottom. I wonder what happened if I hit start debugging. Yeah, we just say, hey man, I don't even know what to run. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so you got to type everything here. Again, because remember, VS Code is just a text editor, right? You could add some stuff. Right, if you get really sophisticated, and maybe some people have, where you can run the simulations inside VS Code using the run command, um, it's extensible in that way. But for us, for right now, we're just working with the command line. Um, Dylan says, you could also make a batch file to run each time if you didn't want to input the commands repeatedly. Yes, um, in fact, that was a... 
Um, I need to send that out to everybody. Devin wrote a batch file to do exactly that. So I need to pass I that over. I an updated one because I didn't realize you could directly open up the uh, file in DGT. Uh, so okay. An yeah. So Devin wrote us a, I'll email it out to the class, but Devin wrote a batch file that will do all of that for us. Um, so where do you access? Uh, the extent, do you have that way? We are using does have that um, the arrow. You're saying so you just have to enable it, and you have to save it with that arrows. Man, look at that Devin's killing it. Let's see. So you're saying you got to enable it? So extend the arrow lock on the gear. Yeah. And then you have to uh, select the where it has none selected by default. Gotcha. Take a look at that later. To get those squealies. All right. So let's see. Oh, could you ask how do you access the terminal window? So you can access it by. Coming up to terminal, new terminal, or by hitting control tilde on the keyboard. So that'd be control plus apostrophe. We'll let you pop open the terminal. All right, so that's how we do that. I want to spend some time. We've only got about 10 minutes left. I wanna, I wanna mess around with the test bench here because you know, it's not always like the easiest, right? It was easy for us now to just say GTK wave and kind of click through because there wasn't that many um, inputs. It wasn't that extensive. And so we kind of need a better way to test, right? Wouldn't it be cool if our test pinch could just tell us if we had errors or not? So give me like 30 seconds to pull the thing. So I'm trying to find some documentation that I should have opened for class but forgot to. making sure I know what I was doing. Oh, okay, let's see. How do we open GTK Wave? Did you say what do we type to run the file? So again, you don't run anything. Remember, we have to do iVerilog, option O. We talked about this last time. Just, you type in the same stuff that you did in the command line. iVerilog, option O. Um, you know, circuit two dot VVP, circuit two underscore TB dot V, and then VVP, circuit two dot VVP to run the simulation, and then to open up GTK Wave, you just type in GTK Wave, and then the name of the file, circuit two dot VCD, and that pops open. So yeah, it's the exact same stuff that we did in the command prompt on Monday.
Okay. Yeah, it's another thing. So it says, for the VCD file, I recommend right-clicking on the file in File Explorer and setting it to open with gtkwave.exe when double-clicked. So yeah, that's another way to do it pretty easily. Okay, so what we want to do is kind of put some output up here. Yeah, the dash O. The option O is important. Okay, so instead of having to go to GTK Wave, what if we could just sort of view the output directly? So we can do that with the display command. This is, or so dollar sign display. Right, this will show us the output. So, for example, if we wanted to just have it list out the true table that we got for y, we would say, you know, y equals um, percent d, or actually we're going to use b for binary, and then feed it the value of y. Just like that. Um, you may have seen this from your programming classes. This just gives it a placeholder for the value, and then you tell it what you want to see right there. And then we can just paste that into our guy. So we need to go ahead and run iVerilog again. Option O to create a new .vvp file. Underscore tb .v. And then VVP circuit two dot VVP. And there we go. See, now it actually put out the value of our truth table. There's a couple more customizations that we can do here. Notice that we had three bits of B for binary. We could have also changed these to D's for decimal and written it all in decimal. So we could have said D. 0, D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, and D7. So even though we're listing everything here in decimal, because we put a 3 here, Verilog knows that it's a 3-bit value. So if I can run this again, you know, I'll get the same stuff. So I can even modify, let's see. Nah, I don't wanna mess with that just yet. Okay, any questions about that? So you can use a D instead of a B. Um, you could also use an H for hex. That would work just as well if you've got to use hexadecimal. And There's no way to use a for loop to make it so it's a lot simpler by down all those if you have like four inputs. You bet, man. Yeah, so, so let's create an integer I. So the question is, can we just use a for loop to do all this? Here, let me do this. Let me wrap all of that in a comment. So let's do this. Let's say for i equals three decimal zero, i less than three decimal eight. Now remember, you've always got to, because again, we're working with bits, you got to specify the number of bits that you're using, otherwise stuff gets weird. Um, at least I think. Uh, we're gonna mess around, we're gonna experiment with this a little bit. I plus plus, but then remember we do begin and end. So we'll say A, B, and C equals I, and we'll add the rest of this stuff. All right, let's take a look and see what that does. Um, I didn't practice this ahead of time, so this might throw an error. So I threw a warning. It says, hey, so an integer has a, a higher bit value. Um, but it seemed to have worked. Ooh, it didn't display the stuff. So it didn't run anything. Let's do this. Zero. Less than eight. There we go. So it didn't like that I had the three bit values there. So yeah. So now we've reduced everything to a for loop. 
And now we're kind of off to the races there. I know some folks get really sophisticated and they do stuff like import Excel spreadsheets that have all of this data in it and just have it like run against the Excel spreadsheet. Um, we're not going to get that advanced in this class. All right, let's see. What do we want to do? We only got about four minutes left. So yeah. Um, so display like let's see. Um, the display line still calls for binary. Um, it doesn't have to, right? I use binary because it's ones or zeros. Um, but seeing as it's only one bit, I bet I can get away with calling it decimal as well. Just like that. Yeah, so I changed it to modulo D and use it as decimal. But as you can see, we got the same result in either case. If you display that integer in GTK way, uh, it does not like it. What's that? It just shows natural integer value for it, but like the way it is, it's angry. GTK wave gets mad? If you do the integer I in there. GTK wave circuit2.vcd. Let's take a look. What are you talking about, man? Looks good to me. Like if you look at the actual line, it just like looks like it squiggles back and forth with two different uh, waypoints up of each other, one high, one low, same time. Yeah, so that's because it's a multi-bit value. Check it out. So it's actually it's 32 bits. And so I just went and double clicked on it. And you can break it out and see all of the bits. So if we come down here, we can see that 0, 1, 2, 3 is sort of clocking through the bits that we need. So yeah, when you have mul when you have a bus, when you have multiple bits wrapped up in one, we're gonna talk about this in more detail on Friday. Um, but when you have multiple bits wrapped up in one signal, when you have a bus, that's what it does. It just sort of shows it like flipping like this, and then it puts the value in the bus. Um, we could also change um, the data format. So that's given in decimal. We could come here and change it to um, let's see binary, except that's gonna be a huge number. We change it to hex, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, but we could also say, well, we're using all these bits that we don't need. One thing we could do is change it from an integer parameter to a reg, which is a register, and say, well, we're going to make that register three bits. So what we'll do there is say reg two in brackets, two colon zero i. And then now. Whoa, look at that. It went forever. Now we need to actually specify 3D0, 3D8, it's gonna get mad at me again. Or else it didn't display. Okay, maybe scratch that, don't use I. <laughs> Something else weird has happened. Oh. So it's nice you get to watch me like debug in real time. Let's lose that. Let's just keep it there for now. We don't mind the extra bits. We can afford them. All right. So um, we're out of time. There's one last thing I want to talk to you guys. Well, first off, are there any questions about this? We'll talk about messing with regs and stuff of multiple bit sizes a little bit later, but I need to go back and make sure I'm not just debugging in front of you guys the whole time. So while I wait and see if there are any questions, I'm going to pull up real fast the project. We will talk in a little bit more detail about what you need to do for that project on Friday, but I wanted to, and I haven't posted it yet because I need to write the test bench for it, but I wanted to go over it with you guys real fast and see if you had any questions. And you can maybe start thinking about it and getting started. So your first project, it'll be due a week from this Friday called an Intro to Combinational Logic and Verilog. You're going to make a module 
that does this circuit. Implement a logic circuit which can perform either addition or subtraction on a two-bit binary number or on two on two-bit binary numbers. There'll be two two-bit data inputs A and B, as well as one one-bit control input C. There'll be a two-bit output Y, and the operation of Y is described below. You don't need to include an output for carry out, and you do not need to account for overflow conditions. So you don't need to carry out and you don't need to worry about overflow. You just need to make a you know, you're going to need a couple of components here, right? There's a number of different ways to do it. You could just do it sort of directly um, using a truth table. You could make the adder and the subtractor and use a multiplexer. Um, there's a number of approaches that will work to this solution. But the way it's going to work is I will, I'll will i post this this afternoon on Blackboard. Like I said, it will be due a week from Friday. Um, and I will also give you the test bench that I'll use to grade you. So you make sure you run your module against the test bench. Um, to make sure that it's working properly and that, you, that it runs and that you get a good grade and all that fun stuff. Um, are there any questions about sort of this project description? Like I said, I'll post it later this afternoon after I've finished the test bench for it. So the test bench, you'll send us to be only by the .v file. Yeah, so you will only submit your .v file. And I'll run it against the, against the test bench. But we can talk about it more on Friday. So with that, we are totally out of time. And if there are no more questions, comments, or concerns, um, that's it. Stay warm, and I'll see you guys on Friday.